Hey there. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. For those of you who follow this regularly, you know that I'm a huge believer in running a business, not running a restaurant, and building a powerful brand. Well, today's guest, Dale Schwartz, is the CEO and co-founder of Pinstripes, a large when I say large, 30,000 square foot venues that are all around bowling and bocce, Italian-American food to perfection, and providing real experiences. And it is all about running a business. I'm speaking with Dale about so many things. We're going to be talking about finances. We're going to be talking about leadership, accountability, brand building, concepts, marketing, that is proven to work, that's trackable. It covers a lot of ground. You're not going to want to miss this. Plus, Pinstripes is growing huge. You know, it was amazing. I was on my way to the New York City food show this past weekend, and I drove by a Pinstripes concept, and it just jumped out at me as a fun place to go, and they're covering all the bases. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. Thanks so much to our audience and sponsors. And if you haven't already, please check out the show notes to this week's episode. We have something that is called the Profit Maximizer. And for less than the cost of a craft beer, for seven bucks, you can get some immediately actionable, proven ideas to increase the profit in your restaurant or hospitality operation. So check that out in the show notes. And on with this week's episode. Enjoy. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Rockstars, this year, give your team the gift of Pop Menu AI Answering, a simple solution for phones ringing off the hook. AI Answering handles calls 24-7, 365 days a year, so your staff can focus on in-person guests. Customize your greetings and responses, answer common questions, promote specials and events, and send follow-up links to ordering and reservations. AI Answering handles it all while escalating more complex conversations back to your team. Now, never miss another tasty revenue opportunity. Pop Menu is the marketing technology platform designed to make growing your restaurant easy. Discover more AI restaurant tools that turn your to-do list into an already done list. Request a demo today and my listeners for a limited time will get $100 off their first month plus lock in one unchanging monthly rate. Go now to popmenu.com slash rockstars. Again, get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Listen, from one restaurateur to another, and I hope you GMs out there listening as well are paying attention. Marketing should never be an experiment. Oh, I tried this or I tried that. No. Any of your valuable dollars that you spend on marketing should absolutely be trackable. You should know exactly where the business is coming from and that it's driving return on your investment. You spend a certain amount of money, you want to make far more money in return from that marketing, if you can track it. So pay attention. My friend Dyson runs a business called The Birthday Club, and his program is done for you. Because we know that everybody dines out on their birthday. It's a tradition. It's a celebration. But not only do they not come in by themselves, they bring many friends with them. They usually have free spending and large check averages. It's very profitable business. So why leave it to chance? Why let your competitors get all the birthday business? So again, the Birthday Club is a done-for-you program. All you have to do is check out www join the birthday club.com slash birthday rockstar. It's a great program. If I still owned and operated restaurants today after decades, it's something I would definitely be doing. It's worth checking out. Join the birthday club.com slash birthday rockstar. Welcome back everyone to the restaurant rockstars podcast. So glad to have you here. Dale, welcome to the show. How are you today? Terrific. I'm terrific. You've got a very exciting, fast-growing concept, and we're going to talk all about that. But before we do, please tell us your hospitality backstory. Where did it all start for you? And you can take us back as far as it goes. Sure. In that case, I'll take it back six years to Cleveland. Grew up in Cleveland, bold as a kid. Always enjoyed it. Played football, went to Colgate. So I, I initially, after business school, I spent four years in 
Manhattan with a private equity group and was enjoying it, but certainly wanted to get back to the principal side. I had started an asphalt business when I was 17 in Cleveland and always tasted the entrepreneurial side. I was going to buy a bowling alley in 1989 on the Upper West Side and coined the name Pinstripes in 1989, bowling pin, pinstripe suit. Myself and a couple of friends, we were going to do a bowling alley with quality upscale food and do it different and right and didn't do it. I got busy and then I left New York, traveled, uh, went back to Europe and elsewhere. And then after starting a pharmacy business that was combining prescription products with homeopathy, et cetera, I kept mentioning for 10, 15 years, this pinstripes idea and finally said, life's too short almost 20 years ago now and spent two years putting all the pieces together to start Pinstripes. And we've been at it for almost 18 years now, and we'll talk about it, but that's the summary backstory. Wow. So you've got varied experience as well as business skills, and that made all the difference for me. I applied business skills to a business that is not traditionally run by MBAs. And a lot of people run restaurants, but they don't necessarily run businesses. And that's a paradigm shift. It's a mindset shift. I I just came back from New York City. This past weekend, I was speaking at the International Restaurant and Food Service Show at the Javits Center. And ironically, I knew this was an upcoming podcast episode. And we were visiting a friend in New Jersey last Saturday, and I drove through Paramus and there's pinstripes. And I'm like, wow, how ironic. There it is. And it's right next to the highway. And it was this yeah. building and it looks so appealing from the road. And I had a very general idea of what it was all about. We're going to dive into uh, the concept yeah. a little bit more, but I thought that was a little ironic. But anyway, thank you very much for sharing that story. When I owned restaurants, I didn't run a restaurant, I ran a business. But my products were not food and drink. They were entertainment, consistency, and a whole lot of good times. And I know that's what Pinstripes is delivering. Let's talk about some of the key learnings that early in your career, regardless of the industry, that made a difference for you that you've applied to this concept. Key learnings that that goes back a number of years. Certainly, you have to have a passion for what you do. So part of the magic of Whole Foods back in the early days were the, the team members cared about food, Home Depot. What Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank did, they hired tradesmen that cared about lumber and nails, et cetera. And that matters. In our case, I mean, we, I, I stole the term from the former CEO of Trader Joe's, John Shields. When, when we hire team members, we tell a lot of our team, if you're not having fun, leave. Because if you're not having fun, we happen to be in the hospitality entertainment business and our, our guests come to enjoy phenomenal food and have fun. But if our team members aren't having fun, it's not the right fit. And if they don't have a passion for either preparing phenomenal food or allowing guests to have just a phenomenal memory or experience, then it's not the right fit. So passion matters a lot. We, we can take team members that maybe don't have a background in hospitality. I didn't. And if you just care, it, it, it matters. I, I think one of the other, call it key takeaways, is fun game we at times play we play for perfection when when our managers or our team members are in the venue perfection is everything from the temperature to the lighting to the level of music is the venue clean and and the table set up and is the food perfect and if that if if you raise the bar high as such then it gets a little fun and people appreciate high standards and if you don't care come back to the passion issue then you don't then you don't set the standards high enough and then you get into a death spiral in, in whatever industry it is. Yeah, I think important to have the passion, but also to want to do something phenomenally well. That's a competitive advantage right there because when your guests walk in the door, they know if a restaurant or a business is dialed and running on all cylinders versus that controlled chaos. And I think setting that bar for perfection, holding your team accountable to those standards and delivering amazing hospitality, it was the key to my success. I'm sure it is to yours. Let's talk about going back 18 years ago, the early history of pinstripes. We talk about the inspiration and the vision that you had a long time ago. You're in private equity, the pinstripes thing. You were a big bowler. Mm -hmm. My childhood was every birthday party was at a bowling alley. It was back then it was those Brunswick lanes when it wasn't candle pin. It was all about big balls. And every one of my friends would have their birthday parties there. And I would too, all the way through high school. That was a big deal. And it was a lot of fun. 
And then bowling lost this cachet. It used to be a huge sport and then it, and now it's back, which is amazing. But 18 years ago, you had this vision and then you decided, let's do this. What were some of the early challenges or even setbacks to getting that concept to fruition in your first location? Yeah. So to put in context, 18 years ago, yes, our first location, we built ground up in, in the suburbs of Chicago, in the North Shore. Part of the main inspiration at the time, the president of Brunswick at the time had suggested I read a book called Bowling Alone. <clears throat> that, And mind you, we opened May 2000, ended up being two months before the iPhone was introduced. So all the sensitivities about connecting and spending quality time together. This book, Bowling Alone, yeah, it was written by a Harvard economist, 600-page dense book that tracked back then the decline in PTA attendance, the decline in voting, basically the decline in people spending quality time together. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just been exacerbated with technology mm-hmm. and the iPhone, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So <clears throat> the original plan and vision was to go back to the future and to your point, br- try to break the stereotype of bowling that got a little past itself. Years ago, bowling was just fun. And then too many of the traditional lanes didn't fix themselves up and it suffered from some of the stereotypes of dirty carpet or smoky in- environments. So mm-hmm. we tried to do that differently. It certainly caught people's attention. The, the challenge in the early days, and, and at times still the challenge is we're constantly having to break the stereotype that yes, we're a bowling facility and yes, we have bocce, but the expectation is that if you're in the entertainment business, the food must be just okay because it's the exception of the rule to have phenomenal cuisine amongst entertainment. Golf, Buck Shack, main event, a host of others play in the space. And, And our challenge was we wanted to have food that is extraordinarily high quality. Hillstone, Houston's equivalent, that's hard to do. And so it took time. It took time, it still takes time to break that stereotype and and break what Alfred Talbin referred to years ago is that threshold resistance to get people to come to a mall once upon a time and to get people to come to pinstripes for lunch, for dinner, for Sunday brunch and, and view us as a restaurant with entertainment not a bowling alley with food. And, and that was a challenge. And, and at times still is a challenge, but that was a key challenge in the early days. Yeah, I totally see that. There was also a trend. And I, I use that word because there are a lot of concepts that used to be called entertainment that just had yeah. flash and sizzle, and then they just didn't have staying power. And maybe that was because the food and the guest service or maybe the atmosphere is just tired. Okay, we tried it once. It was no big deal. Rainforest Cafe comes to mind, right? They yeah. grew really yeah. fast and they were popular for a short time and then they fizzled out. And now you're talking about, you call it experiential dining. And it's based around something that people can come together and share. In addition to great food, they can share great experiences and fun times. And it's got broad appeal. It's kids, it's teenagers, it's adults, it's people who bowl, it's people who've never bowled before. It's maybe introducing (laughs) someone who bowls to bocce. I mean, you're, you're combining all that stuff, but it's seamlessly integrated into an experience. I like that you call it experiential dining. Would you say that it's got legs? It's going to last because this feeling that you deliver and the experiences you deliver will never grow old. No, correct. I I think two key issues. One is in in terms of lasting, the the goal for us from day one was to create an environment that is picture Napa Valley meets Tuscany. And I know we were talking about Zermatt earlier in the Matterhorn. Hmm. So That was always the vision. And admittedly, Italian-American cuisine plays off the bocce and bowling and Italian-American wine. Right. But the feel, that overall feel, that timeless rustic feel was was always true north. That's much different than flashy neon or the example of Planet Hollywood and, and some other concepts that run the risk of trying too hard to be flashy and bright blue colors. Okay, that can come and go. Piece number two is it's not easy to play for best in class. So what I mean by that is uh, we still don't sell Red Bull, never have. 
And for the first eight years, we didn't serve shots. So if somebody came to the to our bar and wanted a shot of vodka or a shot of tequila, we didn't want the wrong type of drinking. So we love when people drink and enjoy themselves, but we wanted quality. And again, back to differentiate ourselves from some others that indiscriminately uh, might serve whatever. And mind you, our liquor licenses allow us to stay open at two in the morning, but I still believe what my mom said years ago, generally speaking, you only get in trouble after either midnight or one in the morning. So nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not, generally nothing good. So we don't have any problem doing last call on weekends at midnight and weekdays at maybe 9, 30, 10 o'clock because we, we open a location and want to be a part of the fabric of the community for 20, 30 years, not just do really well for two, three years and then see sale, sales start to decline. Uh, so our, our first location after 18 years, sales have gone up every year. S sales are more than double what they were 17 years ago. And, and, and it has staying power as, as a result. But that's not easy to do. Uh, it's not easy to do. And we tried to do it well. It's interesting you say that because my very first restaurant was a wood-fired pizzeria. It was 80 seats to start, later grew to 100 seats. But we tried to keep it simple because I didn't know the restaurant business. I knew mm -hmm. business. I didn't know restaurants. And we had wood-fired pizzas. We had one pasta. We had one salad. And we had beer and wine only, soft jazz music. And we didn't want that drinking crowd. That So we didn't have a full bar. We used to have these Italian chicken pitchers that we imported from Italy that we poured our wine in. And then you would pour it, and the wine would come out of the beak. And it was like this really tame experience. But in order to grow the business, we suddenly had to go over to the dark side and bring in rock bands and full bar and shots and mug clubs and steak and sushi and pizza. And we were everything to everybody. And it was a raucous environment most of the time. When that dining room transitioned to nighttime and yeah. you know, that sort of thing, it got really crazy. We used to call it the three ring circus. But you've been yeah. able to find that balance between increasing revenue and having a, a venue that is family friendly all the time and not and, and avoiding some of those challenges, the liquor liabilities of over serving people. I got mm -hmm. out of the business and sold it because things were starting to get a little yeah. crazy. And when you've got really good customers that are in your place four and five times a week, but some of them have some of these challenges and you can't overserve them legally, yet they are your best customers. It's I couldn't handle that anymore. That was a yeah. really good transition. It's a tough balance. And keep in mind, with in our business, Roger, almost half our business is private events. Yeah. So right. the private events, both social and corporate, mm -hmm. weddings, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, 1500 person corporate events. The fun challenge is marrying that qualitatively with the call it open play non event business. So, back to that example, yes, you might come to the pinstripes on a Saturday night and there's a 200 person wedding alongside an 80 year old birthday party and a six year old birthday party, and the bar's full, and the bistro's full, and it all needs to be choreographed together. So, that wedding party doesn't want to walk in and see shots flying at the bar and just the wrong crowd, it needs to work together. And, and we try to do that. <laughs> we try to do that. Wow, that takes a lot of staff and consistent experiences across different types of, from events to small private parties to serving the everyday public, playing games and eating your cuisine. That, how many people does that require in a typical location? Yeah, so we have generally about 120 to 140 team members, each location, full-time, part-time. We've got about 2,000 team members now between our 16 open locations and a few more soon opening in the works. Um, and admittedly, just to share the other major learning, back to your first question, everything we do, you'll never hear me or our team referred to any team members as employees so thank you it's the I hate team. that word yeah we i don't know if you either recently saw the movie or ever read the book boys in the boat Clooney. just i want just to movie. see that movie yeah it's on my list it yeah. looks really inspiring yeah yeah the, the the movie's good the book is phenomenal phenomenal and thanks for the tip we've been we, we've been talking amongst our team now for about nine, 10 years after I first stumbled across and read the book almost every week in emails or otherwise, the, the, the term just let's row together is 
extremely important. So in the restaurant business, some of the normal strife between back of house, front of house, and now in our case, the event team, oh, if yes. you don't do it, you've got all kinds of drama and problems and we don't always do it right, but we certainly tried to row together. And when it, when you really do that, it's magical and fun. So I'm hearing leadership, but I'm also hearing fun. And when you combine those two things and give people opportunities, then they tend to stay and there's longevity. I mean, this a lot of this industry is still struggling with labor right now, but it seems like you may not be having as big a challenge because you're providing a really exciting dynamic environment where like-minded people come together to work and it's as much fun working as it is being a guest playing and eating. Would you say that's true? Are you having any challenges there? Operators and managers, my restaurants were all about delivering experiences and creating memorable events. You might say we curated experiences that exceeded our guests' expectations while we dominated the competition. We also had lots of big charge admission parties and live music shows. So let me tell you about Talk, the industry's first reservations platform. Talk provides tools and support that empower restaurant partners to thrive by adapting to changing times and guest tastes. Talk's industry experience team take great pride in solving the toughest problems faced by your restaurant. From flexible reservations and a solution for no-shows to curating memorable experiences, Talk provides your restaurant everything you need to bring your vision to life now and in the future. With Talk, you can showcase the best of your restaurant in one place. You can turn a table, a meal, or even a Tuesday night into an experience that you can sell and market on Talk, driving revenue from every seat. Talk customers rave about the support and commitment to hospitality that their guests experience. Request a free demo today at jointalk.com slash podcast. Rockstars, when I needed equipment from my former restaurants, I called Restaurant Equippers. Restaurant Equippers has served independent food service operators just like you going on 60 years. You'll find all the top names and extensive inventory at their huge warehouse stores in Ohio, Michigan, and New Jersey. You can shop equippers.com or call their national order office at 800 800- 235-3325. Their experienced specialists will help you get the best equipment and supplies and save you money. Thousands of name brand products are available for immediate store pickup or shipment. Just like me, when you need something, you need it now. Restaurant Equippers will make sure you get the equipment and supplies you need when you need them at a price you want to pay. They shop the world to find the best products and value. Give Restaurant Equippers a call for all your equipment and supply needs or check their website, equippers.com. We've certainly had some challenges, but we've navigated the, the people front, I think, quite well. I mean, piece number one is we have a very strong tenured culture. Yes, I started the business 18 years ago. Chris, our CLO, has been with me 18 and a half years. So he came on board 10 months before we opened, leaded our chief people officer, Came on board six weeks after that, 18 years. Caesar, our executive chef, has been with me and us now 13, 14 years. Brent and Gary, our two regional directors, 16, 17 years, respectively. That tight culture helps set the true north. And then, yes, the a lot of the growth prospects makes it easier to retain and keep a lot of our managers and salary team members. And then you just have to work a little harder nowadays to find team members. There's a lot of people post-COVID that exited the restaurant business and found it easier to work remote. There's nothing remote about providing phenomenal service in the restaurant business. You have to back to the passion issue, enjoy it. So we just have to work a little harder and call a few more people and train a little better. But we, we've never not opened for lunch or had to cut back hours because we can't find team members. Never. That's wonderful. What a great position to be in. And uh, yeah, I can totally imagine that the team chemistry and the respect that they have for each other and just what a fun place. Like when there's a so much is happening in the concept at any given time, how can you help but not be swept up in the whole excitement of it all? What about key success factors of your concept? You talked about excellent dining, like not just food, but really and perfection. That takes a lot to achieve. And you mentioned Caesar's been with you for so long. So he's obviously leading an outstanding team of kitchen people and bringing them up. And you have an Italian-American menu. So 
tell us about the menu a little bit. What's what are some of the key items that that people just love? Sure. So first, to put in context, our venues are large. So these are twenty five to thirty five thousand square foot, almost invariably two level spaces, and that's the pure indoor space. And then every location we have outdoor patios, sometimes on two levels. So th there's a Cirque du Soleil, almost Willy Wonka fun adventure. Mm -hmm. feel when you're in pinstripes that, that is partially the decor but also two levels there's just an excitement you, you may come into our venue and walk in and see bocce to the left bowling to the right bar bistro outdoor patio walk upstairs and see banquet space and more bowling or bocce so there's just an adventure excitement because it's not a traditional restaurant where it's somewhat obviously a bar and a bistro and one dimensional as such there's a little of that surprise and delight at Pinstripes. The music is beautiful and the lights might be dim. The, the music level never gets in the way of people talking amongst themselves. So we, we try not to overdo the volume of the music. We, we want it to complement the experience. Our, our service is certainly a differentiator. Our team members and, and how they're handling the guests, our food Back to that whole discussion, Scratch Kitchen, we make our own pizza dough, we make some of our own pastas, we make our soups, we make our own gelato sorbet. So our food is really good. Our oh, wine wow. list and yep. craft beers are great. Yeah. You got gelato yeah. too. That's wonderful. No, we make, you no, know, we're rolling out Ben and Cherries. So a stracciatelle with- That's my favorite, beer. by the way. I love that. That's my favorite well, flavor. Stracciatelle. Stracciatelle is hands down the best. Hands gotcha. down. Uh, and then bocce and bowling, right? So the gaming mm -hmm. elements, we intentionally do the two. So to put in context, there's no video games, there's no darts, there's no shuffleboard, there's no ping pong. So we, we keep it just to those two, call it competitive socializing games with the commonality of rolling a ball and having fun. And then marketing is the other, call it magical sauce, that whether it's in the venue, cueing certain messages, or certainly how we're marketing outside of the venue matters. Just the overall brand messaging plays into what we do. So that gives you, pun intended, a flavor um, of, of all the different pieces. So one of the biggest challenges in our business is maximizing table turns, say, and throughput. And providing experiences to guests so that they enjoy the experience without feeling rushed. Yet when there's a line out the door, you don't want people camping. We call it two hour experiences. Now, suddenly you're combining food with bowling and bocce. Are you, obviously it helps to have huge 30,000 square foot venues, but are people waiting to get into the experience? How long is the average person or group staying playing bowling or bocce and eating and you're able to turn those people over and get more people in. Like, how do you maximize throughput in such a huge operation that's doing so much, but it seems like it's time intensive to play to bowl? I know I bowl, so I understand uh, that. How does that work? Yeah, no, great question. I'll, I'll give you two answers. One on the call it gaming side is distinguished from call it the dining side. So first of all, on the private event side, when, when we host and pre-book an event, we, we might book a wedding or bar mitzvah six months out and that's somewhat understood. They, they might have the ballroom space for four hours. They might have bowling lanes, some of them for an hour. That, that, those rules of engagement are pretty clean and clear. For bowling and bocce, um, it, it is intensely inventory management coupled with dynamic pricing. On a busy Saturday night, there's the scarcity of bowling lanes. So yes, we generally put aside lanes for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And if you, our, our guests pay for an hour or two. So at the end of two hours, generally speaking, you, you do need to come off the lane because we have someone else coming on the way. For the gaming, it, it matters because we, we've got a, somewhat, a little more stay on the clock. Contrast that with, call it tra the traditional restaurant lunch and dinner. No problem. If somebody wants to camp and sit in our bistro for two, three hours, all for it. I've joked to some customers or guests that are there at night for dinner. 
and they're there for two hours, three hours, four hours. And they say, do you need the table? Literally, if they want to spend the night, they'll bring you eggs in the morning. Other restaurants that strategize, they don't sell dessert because they want to turn the tables faster or they're bothering the table because of turn, turn. We don't do that. If somebody wants to lounge and take their time at pinstripes, that's off. We've got large enough venues and we can find, generally speaking, space for others. But I've literally, I've seen people on the bocce court with grandmothers asleep in a comfortable leather lounge chair of ours. Yeah. That's beautiful. If the grandmother, grandfather wants to rest and take a nap while the three generations are drinking and playing bocce and having fun together, terrific. And if that means they're going to camp out and, and spend an, another 45 minutes in that seat, all the power to them. You're not going to see us zapping them and say, hey, sorry, can you wake grandma up? We need that. We need that chair. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen at good stripes. No. No, I never took reservations in my businesses because it was always first come, first serve. I found that most efficient in serving the maximum number of people because there's some challenges with reservations. People don't show up on time. Two people walk in when it's a reservation for eight. Now you're waiting for the others and it slows things down. Do you take walk-ins? Do you take reservations? Do you have a hybrid of both? Like, how does that work? We do have a hybrid of both so on the gaming side. So one reason we migrated from open table, for example, to we, we, we happen to currently use seven rooms. Open oh, table would rooms. not allow us to take online gaming, bowling bocce reservations. Yep. And that was problematic because we wanted to. Some of our entertainment peers were doing so. So we do take, it's back to the inventory management for gaming. So if we have 18 bowling lanes, if, if, if we let the event team take all 18 lanes and book parties on Friday, Saturday night, they would gobble up and take all 18 lanes. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to keep a certain number of lanes open for kind of walk-in and or a certain, certain number of the bowling lanes available inventory online to book an online reservation. So that's part of the choreographing of the inventory. But no, lunch and dinner, love taking reservations. Pre-COVID, we used to not take reservations on our outdoor patios because at times the complexity of, if you take a reservation for a patio, you can sometimes be in the weather business. If it starts raining, what do you do? Well, we learned during COVID, people really enjoy sitting on the outdoor patios. And we did a very robust business on our patios. And so now we take reservations on the patios. And high class problem, if we're busy with reservations and it starts raining, we'll make some adjustments. So we, but yes, some restaurants don't take reservations. We, we do and need to. And, and it gives you visibility labor scheduling and a lot of other elements as well that helps build the business. Yeah, tell us about marketing strategy and what's proven to work for you. And obviously when I say this, there's so many aspects to marketing. There's social media, there's influencers, there's cab drivers and hotel concierges, and there's traditional advertising, but I'm sure it's so important to you to have trackable marketing programs that you know that are delivering ROI. What is your strategy and what works? Yeah. Um, first of all, it, it, because our business has that heavy component of the private event side of our business, on the private event side, the digital spend for Google AdWord and other equivalent spends to drive lead generation, that marketing spend is very meaningful and very important because it drives leads. And, and really, that's just part of a form of marketing. We're effectively marketing the ability of us to host events and then trying to convert those leads. So we, we've, for years now, leaned into that smart marketing spend to drive leads. We also, again, on the event side of our business, quite uniquely, so we have three, four, five event sales team members, generally per location, on-site, yes booking events every day. We don't do it centralized like some other concepts. So th that is a marketing effort. Th those are team members on the phone or online or outboarding every day, touching the communities and businesses to book events. And, and when we do it right, that becomes a flywheel that helps build the non-event side of our business. And then we're, we're certainly 
uh, both on the digital side, doing a lot of other digital advertising to drive reservations, to drive funnel awareness. We also do a considerable amount of local store marketing, guerrilla marketing, touching the concierges at hotels and visiting the malls that surround us, telling our story. We've done some billboard in the past. We've done some direct mail on occasion. We don't do radio, generally speaking. We certainly don't do television. We're not at a scale yet to do. We do very little newspaper. We did a little more years ago. So it's a digital heavy focus coupled with a lot of boots on the ground, event team, guerrilla team that all drives a lot of our marketing efforts. I look at your locations and they're like giant billboards for a fun time out. So it almost is it. No, it is a marketing avenue unto itself to have a 30,000 square foot facility, pinstripes, you can't miss it. How do you pick the location so that they're highly visible? I I think I told you that I drove by your Paramus location. It was right next to the highway. I couldn't miss it. I'm like, there it is. Wow. That looks like an amazing place to go. So that's marketing. But how do you find those spaces that are 30,000 square feet in great locations that become marketing vehicles unto themselves? The whole, call it real estate strategy, back in the early days, call it 18, 19 years ago, the the first strategic debate internally, myself and our early board, was at the one extreme, do we expand like Lifetime Fitness, Maggiatas, where somewhat of a standalone, are we unique enough that feel the dreams, people will find us? Mm-hmm. As distinguished okay. from, yeah. do we just get right in the mix? Do we go to Garden State Plaza? Aside from the visibility off of Interstate 4, do we get in the mix amongst foot traffic and other like-minded co-tenants? We have skewed over the last number of years. Increasingly, we like to be in the mix. And the caveat there is we want to be in the mix, in the right high-quality lifestyle centers or malls. So the whole Amazon effect and the bifurcation of in our view, the A quality malls are going to get better. And those B minus or C or D mall properties are going to get killed. And so we like to be Garden State Plaza is a phenomenal example. So we took over the Uniqlo space. Westfield's in the midst of an additional $700 million expansion on the other side of the mall, yeah, redeveloping the board and Taylor with residential and all kinds of exciting offerings. Mm-hmm. And they're going to continue to upgrade our side, those are the exciting properties. And when we do those, yeah, that that large billboard feel and facade of pinstripes attracts a lot of attention. It certainly helps the mall property and other tenants and co-tenants. But to your point, yeah, love that you drove by and or pulled up and you saw some of the huge signage that that we also put even a little on other side of our space, just until some of the tenants are opening, it's a powerful form of marketing for us. Yes. You certainly have the 30,000 foot CEO view of your company and you have specialists within your company. I'm sure you have a CFO and you've got chief marketing officers and all these people. And you said that you've got dedicated salespeople for event space. And you're obviously directing these people from above and you're looking at reports Let's switch to finances for a moment. What are the key performance indicators that mean the most to you? And you're a former finance guy too. So this must mean a lot to you and maintaining, I hate to use the word quotas, but consistency among locations to be meeting certain targets with those KPIs. Let's talk about some of those. Yeah, no, absolutely. So if I start up top, same store sales comps, we call one of our reports, the Bible report, extremely important. So we track same store sales First, for our 13 legacy locations that we can certainly compare, obviously, prior years, but also stack comps. And we track it open play versus events because we need to like to see the trends amongst the two. So that that gets a lot of attention. And KPI or otherwise, what the trends are and what's up and down per location and the aggregate matters. And, And then informs a lot of marketing decisions and other decisions. Then much the same on the sales level, particularly with the newer locations, we are tracking that sales performance versus budget, versus expectations. Comps and discounts, constantly tracking both the positive and negative. Food, liquor costs, so the COGS equation, we take inventory every month and we keep keep a very close eye on 
on, on cost of goods sold, both on the food and liquor front. We also keep a close eye on gaming. Bowling bocce as a percentage of sales. Mm -hmm. So the higher or more business we do gaming, that's 100% gross profit. So gaming has increased for us from 18, 19% to already 23, getting close to 24. Projection mapping, some added technology overlay that we're planning on introducing in the next X number of months could take that 23 up to 25, 30% plus, which could be very lucrative. And then on the expense line, we, we, we keep a very close eye on our some of our fixed salary costs at the store level, our hourly costs, both front of house, back of house, and all kinds of initiatives to control labor, retention and training play into it, and then all the expense line items. So we all of that plays into what's the store contribution dollar amount in margin at the store level. And then now that we're public, and we always did keep a close eye on SGA, we try to run things smart and tight which we do. There's no assistants or secretaries at Pinstripes. We still office out of our first location in Northbrook. You're not seeing myself or our team sitting in some ivory tower or offsite. We're in the venue or, or venues, not esoterically sitting in, in an office building somewhere. Those are the key things we look at. And then behind the scenes, on the marketing front, we're looking at the marketing spend and what the ROI is to the extent we can track reservations or event leads to really get a sense are we spending money that's giving us a fair return, aside from some of the overall awareness issues? And we're very granular in how we track that as well. Since the pandemic, a lot of this industry has struggled with maintaining margins in traditionally a low margin business. Have you been able to maintain your margins with the highest labor costs ever and inflation and all those things without just continually raising prices where the value proposition is lost? That's a balance. How have you handled that? And do you even mind sharing what the average margin is on a typical location for pinstripes? Yeah. So a couple of answers. So the first answer is, the answer is no, but in a positive way. So the answer is, have we had trouble Keeping margins, no. We've actually, our margins have improved post-COVID. So from on, our event business continues to grow. So our, the private event side of our business is very lucrative. So mm -hmm. food costs, labor, liquor costs, lower than on these. So if we're doing a 200-person corporate event, that's a little easier to execute than 54 tops, labor-wise, food cost-wise. That's helped. We've certainly gotten some added scale benefits in some of our purchasing, and even on the labor front, we just continue to get smarter. So we've made some smart moves in terms of open close times, in terms of some staffing levels, and we just train team members better. So we're seeing a lot of efficiencies. So some of the public information that we put out there, we generally expect any new location, year two to do 9 million plus in sales, at least 17% store contribution margin. So at the store level, we have some locations that don't do 90 million, but do already 12 or 13 million in sales where store contribution is 25 to 30%. And, and that's after fully encumbered occupancy rent. Unlike some other peers, we, we don't own our land. We don't own the building. So all of the gross occupancy costs are included before call it our store contribution. But th those are our general targets when locations are call it doing some attractive sales. You know, I think that's also an advantage because there is a pitfall to leasing a space versus owning and controlling your destiny. Yet I would imagine in your locations, it's no one wants to lose that lease because it would be really hard to replicate a new tenant that could come in and assimilate or take over that much space. So you must have long-term really secure leases at reasonable rates that are negotiated, of course, but there's leverage there. Would you say that's true? No, we do have leverage, not debt leverage per se, but we do. I mean, landlords like us for what excitement we bring to a lot yeah, of these too, projects. Too. Right. And they've also provided some very attractive tenant improvement monies, tenant improvement allowances towards the build out of our space. So in every lease, whether it's a 10, 12 initial year term and option, whatever arm wrestling in terms of the rent that we pay factors in the quite attractive tenant improvement monies that landlords also provide because we do bring a lot of excitement 
particularly our ability to program and use second level space. That's very attractive to a lot of landlords that are taking back to Sears or Macy's or JCPenney's boxes that traditionally have two, three levels and not easy to put tenants often on a second level space. Right. We like taking some second level space and that helps the discussions, negotiations considerably. Fantastic. Pinstripes is a prime example of multiple profit centers. And so many operators, I hugely recommend bringing in as many as possible and not just selling food and drink. So obviously you've got bowling, you've got bocce, you've got private events, you've got the public coming in, ordering food and drink, and perhaps not bowling or playing bocce. Outdoor patios. I'm sure you've got a retail merchandise program as well, right? Do you sell lots of retail? We, we, we sell to date very little. Oh, tell me about uh, We do have plans to sell more. We've considered bottling our marinara sauce and certain other products possibly to do something creative with supermarkets. So stay tuned. The other piece that we are going to start pushing more aggressively is off-premise. Admittedly, in the early days, because what we do is so unique, we, we erred on the side of needing and wanting people to come in and experience it because we were a young brand. Um, n- now that our brand awareness is considerably broader, um, we're pushing that off-premise, both with partners, the DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats equivalent, as well as Native, our, our own Olo equivalent ordering online. But that off-premise piece, we're going to be not have active efforts going on as we speak to drive additional sales and off-premise. Because to your point, the more sales opportunities, profit centers within the venue, the better, as long as we choreograph them all the right way. Thank you. We're pushing on that off-premise. So Dale, 16 locations now, four in the pipeline. And what's the big picture? Are you going national in every major market with this? And how long do you anticipate that taking? And what's next after that? Yeah, so we, we went public just about two months ago. Always planned on doing so. And always planned on myself and the team doing this for another 20, 30 years. So back to the whole discussion of having fun and passionately enjoying what we're doing, we want to keep doing it. So we, we the white space opportunity for us in the U.S., we want to open 150 some pinstripes locations all over the country, all company owned in the U.S., and we'll open six to eight a year. So th- this calendar 24, we'll end up opening six plus. We're filling the pipeline as we speak for calendar 25 and 26. So it's going to be in that six to eight a year That's less a constraint of capital and mostly finding the quality sites and having the right culture and team to open them. So you're not going to see us opening 20, 30 locations a year. We don't need to. These are big locations that can do big sales, profit numbers. In six to eight a year, we can create some very substantial value. And then overseas. I've been looking overseas for six, seven years already. And overseas, a little different. We'll look to do at least 100 whether it's London, Tel Aviv, Mexico City, Dubai, with partners. So that'll be more of an asset light, smart partnerships that won't detract from the magic we're doing in the States and the heavy lifting of opening sites and all of our team focus in the U.S. But a lot of these experiential trends, they're happening in real time overseas. And, And we've been sought out for years and we're in some discussions already to forge some exciting partnerships and do our magic overseas as well. So that's the two-pronged overall plan. Does your concept translate to Italy because you're Italian-American as much as we've taken so many cues from Italy and so many restaurant concepts here in America because people in America embrace that culture and the food and the wine, but does a location in Milan ever make sense or a big center? The, the, the Milan, Milan's a good example. Yes, Milan has industry. It, it certainly has the residential piece. It, it's got it's got a vibrance to it. So we, we certainly could do something in Italy. We certainly could do something in the UK and Spain. There's a lot of countries that, that have the same consumer needs and also mm-hmm. have the same real estate developer needs to transform their lifestyle centers or properties. It all, all the same trends, all our view, all the same trends were lagging the U S pre COVID by three, four years, COVID hits 
And everywhere in the world, you didn't have a choice. So everybody was transacting online. Retailers saw the pressure from it. And so tr- those the, the lag time, arguably, is almost eliminated. Mm-hmm. So the trends are real in these overseas countries. And there's already entertainment dining concepts doing their magic in the UK and Dubai and elsewhere and Canada, et cetera. So we're going to look to capitalize on those same trends overseas. Fantastic. Dale, you are a super inspired leader and CEO. You got a really dynamic concept. I'm really just moved by everything that you've achieved so far and the big vision of what's going to happen in the future. I wish you the best of success. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. And no, enjoy it. Enjoy it. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Thanks so much to our audience for tuning in. Thank you so much to our sponsors. We can't wait to see you in the next episode. Everyone stay tuned and stay well. Rockstars, I got to tell you, it really pains me to see restaurants fail. And it pains me just as much to see restaurants with shrinking margins, with rising costs, and being tied to their business 24-7 because they can't afford to pay what I call a leader or someone to help them run their business. And that is so important today, you know, working on your business versus in the business. I travel the country. I've coached lots of restaurants. I speak. I speak to lots of different restaurant people. And I hear the same thing. Why don't my staff respond to what I expect them to do? Why do they not show up for shifts? Why am I not making any money, even though I have a busy restaurant? What can I do about marketing? It's like, what's proven? Now, these are all very logical questions, but the answer really is having a system or a series of systems where all of these things are dialed, where you can tell other people that if you want additional responsibility in this restaurant, I can give it to you. I can recognize and reward your achievement. You can help me run this business. And then I don't have to be tied to it. I can trust my people that they're going to use good judgment. I can find new people by recruiting and not hiring. All of these things, including dialing in your critical finances, is a system. And I need to tell you that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can find these things all in the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. I've spent 23 years starting restaurants and operating them to success. I've been in this business for 30 years, and the Academy is everything I've learned about these systems and running a business, not running a restaurant. What are these foundational systems? Cost controls and maximizing profit, knowing your prime costs, knowing what your sweet spot for inventory, food, beverage, and labor costs. These are really, really important things. More importantly, it's about costing out your menu so that you know exactly how much it costs you to serve every dish to every guest. That's the finance piece of the Academy. We have something called Sales Stars which trains everyone, whether you've got a full-serve sit-down restaurant or you've got a fast, casual, quick-serve or food truck, it trains anyone who interacts with a guest every day to recognize opportunity, to have product and restaurant knowledge, to make friends with your customers and to make suggestions that we all know the guest will enjoy and appreciate. That doubles and triples check averages. That's a system in the academy. There's a marketing section that is not about an experiment. It's not about throwing thousands of dollars out the window, hoping something will work. These are proven ideas that I used in all of my restaurants that cost very little money, but they proved to have ROI. Best of all, they were trackable. I knew exactly where this business was coming from and it delivered ROI or return on investment. Even if you're starting a very first restaurant, this is everything you need to know to literally start your business, Open the doors to that business, put the systems in place, and run it profitably and successfully. So now, the Academy also includes 25 free memberships for anyone on your team so that you can say, hey, go to the finance section and learn this. Put this in place, and I'll give you an incentive for doing so. Help you run your business. Take on this marketing project. Create a catering um, department in our business or any number of things, but additional profit centers. It's not just about food and drink and selling those things. It's about creating a real brand and running a business. And everything I'm talking about is in the Academy. So check it out at restaurantrockstars.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.